Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day. If you're sitting, I want to invite you to stand with us. We're so glad you're here with us. Let's worship Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together. Let's give him everything we've got. Here we go. There's one thing I'm asking. One thing I'm seeking. Hey. A moment that's passing. Now what I'm seeking. I can see air I'm breathing. Oh, I want your presence. Feet on the earth. A heart full of heaven. Feel free. Really consumes me. I can get it up. I can't get it now. But feel your fire burning right through me. I can get it up. I can't get it now. But get away. Yeah. Get away. I can't get it now. But get away. Get away. Come on, everybody. Let's put our hands up. Let's worship Jesus. Yeah. This is a celebration as we celebrate our Father, our Heavenly Father. Let's give Him praise. Yeah. Here we go. We sing. Oh, I'm after your spirit more than a feeling. Say, I don't need a reason to keep chasing who you are. But I can see air and breathe it. I want your presence, feet on the earth, heart full of heaven, feel really consumes me. I can get enough, I can't get enough, I can feel your fire. 
right now, right now. Come on, are you free this morning? Sing it out. Darkness trembles, mountains shake. What was it now comes to win? Every cow breaking free right now.
the Father. Give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask.
Father that we know of that has lived and walked upon the earth and God you so far surpass our greatest imaginations of a loving father a good father God you're so good to us what a privilege it is Lord to be called your sons and your daughters and Lord, we're reminded again today of, of your precious holy word. And you said, Lord, that you have exalted your word even above your name. We remember, Lord, in your word, you said, if you being carnal, being human beings, if you know how to give, give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your heavenly Father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And Lord, on this Father's Day, I can't think of anything more precious. I can't think of anything better for us to ask for as your children. We come before you today, and Lord, we ask for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. It's your Holy Spirit that empowers us to live out this life for your glory, to make an impact in the world in which we live. So God, today we ask again on this Father's Day, knowing that it delights our Heavenly Father's heart when we come before you. And, and God, it's not material things, it's not riches, it's not wealth, it's not fame that we come to you asking for today. We come to you asking that there would be less of us and more of you that you would fill us up with the Holy Spirit. God, we pray especially today for all the dads who are among us and who are watching online. We pray for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon every man of God, every man, every father, every dad, every grandfather. We ask for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon them. God, you, you have dreams 
You have a heavenly mission, a heavenly vision, a heavenly calling for every single man that is listening, that is watching, that is present here today. And we pray that today in your presence, those callings would awaken, that you would stir up the gifts of the Holy Spirit and these men that are with us today, that they would rise up to be mighty men of God, full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, that they would be the priests of their home, that you called them and created them to be. And God, we will honor them. We will honor them and respect them. We will love them and pray for them. God, we come into agreement with you today and we say the yes and the amen to your calling upon every man in this congregation today. Fulfill your will and your divine purpose. God, we ask that you would set every heart, the heart of every man in this room today, and those watching online, set their hearts ablaze with a holy passion for Jesus and for the kingdom of God. Oh God, stir it up within them. In the name of Jesus, pour it out, pour it out. Come on, let's sing that again. Pour it out, pour it out. Let your love you want to in every one of our hearts today and everyone said amen amen oh praise God listen before you're seated today I want to ask you to take a few minutes actually a few seconds to find two or three people and and uh, make a new friend today introduce yourself to someone new and just tell them get ready because God the Father has something special for you and then you can be seated care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You want to borrow the new car? You want to borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy. Super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ew, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? 
Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey, hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Hmm, vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Whoa, money really does grow on trees. Happy Father's Day. Or as we call it a Radiant Church, Happy Rad Dad Day. It's so good to have all of you with us. When you came into the church, you probably saw her. there's some really cool cars out in front. You got to take a look at them. There's not a dad here that will not want to see those cars. And there's a race car as well. Lane's race car is out there. And we have food trucks. So please, after the service, hang out. Let's enjoy ourselves. And let's pray the rain doesn't come until 3 o'clock. And then it can rain all it wants to rain. But until then, we're just going to have a good time today. We're getting a little cloud cover, so it's going to be nice and cool. I think for the last two years, the hottest day all summer came on Rad Dad Day. But this year, it's not going to be the case. Please hang around. Please spend some time with us today. I want to welcome any of you that are here for the first time. It is so good to have you with us. I uh, want to simply say, in just a moment, we're going to be receiving this morning's offering. And when we do, you're under no obligation to give in that offering. But what we would like you to do is to reach in front of you, grab one of our connection cards, and if you would fill that out and drop it in the offering bucket as it goes by, we would consider that your gift today. Let's welcome our newcomers and thank them for being with us today. It's great to have you here. While we're doing that, I don't think we gave a big hand to the dads yet, so let's give them a big hand as well. <laughs> Happy Father's Day once again. Hey, our Ascent class is a great way to get introduced to Radiant Church. Typically at 9 o'clock, every Sunday we have that class, and you can join us next Sunday morning. The Ascent class is a track to help you to learn how to grow in Christ, how to become more like Jesus, and how to really get connected here at Radiant Church and get involved. It's also the track for membership if you'd like to be a member here. But that class typically is at 9 o'clock, and you can join us next week. I'm going to ask the ushers to come at this time. We're going to receive our weekend tithes and offerings. And it is such a blessing, such a joy to be able to give back to God a little bit of what He's given us. And to be part of a church where so many great things are happening. You know, we have outreaches that happen at all three of our campuses. And those watching online may not know this, but we have a campus up in Woodland Park. We have a campus uh, in the north part of Colorado Springs at Research and Powers. And then we have this campus at Maisland. And we had an outreach going on at our Woodland Park campus this weekend, really neat. They do this on a regular basis because there's a farmer's market that meets right across the street. So they set up a booth with a sign that says, Free Prayer. And they have people come over for prayer. We give them bottles of water and coffee. Well, yesterday, it was really neat what happened. Some of those who came for the farmer's market came across and said, you guys prayed for me last year and miracles happened. And they show, shared several testimonies of miracles that happened through the prayers of the people there at the farmer's market. And I, I, there's a lot of stories, but let me just give you one. One story, the person came up and said, you guys are amazing. You prayed for all kinds of things that there's no way you could have known. And those prayers were answered. You guys are like psychics. And they said, oh, no, 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 we're not psychics. We just know the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit spoke to us. And God the Father answered your prayers through the name of Jesus. And so they got all excited and said, pray for us again. They prayed again. And they said, are you sure you're not psychics? That's amazing. But then they had to go through the whole thing again. This was the Holy Spirit at work. And God is working through Radiant Church. And I'm so glad you're a part of it. And one way we're a part of it is through our giving. So let's prepare to receive our offerings today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness toward us. 
We thank you on this Father's Day for every father here. We pray for your grace, your hand of blessing upon them, all the sacrifices they've made to raise children. Lord, I pray that you would reward them many times over. And Lord, we acknowledge that you are our Heavenly Father. You're not a neglectful father. You're not an abusive father. But you're a good father. You are a reflection on us. The very best fathers are nothing like who you are. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are the perfect father, that you're a good father, that you're a father that cares about us and, and wants to meet us where we're at and have a relationship with us. And Father, we thank you for Lane as he comes to share with us about the relationship we can have with you. We ask for your hand of anointing and blessing to be upon us, that we would receive the word of God today with joyful hearts and grateful hearts and our lives would be changed by it. And now, Father, we receive this offering and we thank you for the opportunity to give, that we give not grudgingly or out of any necessity, but we give because you love a cheerful giver. And we give to the glory of God in Jesus' name. Amen. The 2017 Pikes Peak Hill Climb uh, threw a lot at us. The, the year before in 2016, it was like everything went our way. Being able to set my personal best time with a 9.53, breaking the 10 minute barrier, winning the Pikes Peak Open Division. It was just awesome. And then 2017 comes around and we're expecting more of the same. And yet the absolute opposite happened from the very first day of practice. The car struggled. We had a, a really bad vibration right away in the first run. And that was a first indication of what the entire week would be like. We came into race day with high hopes because we knew we had finally fixed the car. We knew our problems were solved even without practice. You know, after racing Pikes Peak 24 years, I felt confident in my abilities to push the car. And so we took the green flag. After overcoming everything, I was putting in a great run, felt very good about the run. We had slower cars ahead of us, and literally about mile 10, one of those cars broke down in the road. I got a red flag, had to turn around and go all the way back down 10 miles down the mountain. And then we had to fuel the car up, take on our second green flag after the Geico team did a phenomenal job and uh, we make it three miles and one of the slower cars ahead of us had an accident and I got another red flag, had to turn around, drive three miles back down the mountain. And the team did a great job again, going over the car, getting it fueled up. Took my third green flag, even though I had a clean road, uh, I get to Devil's Playground uh, in the W section uh, of the mountain and the clouds are rolling in. So I'm like, oh my goodness, now I'm gonna have fog after the week we've had and after two red flags and yet, uh, fortunately, the fog wasn't that thick where I couldn't see the road. So I was able to continue at full speed, but the road was very cool, uh, if not cold, and so it was very slippery. So we weren't able to, uh, to best our 953. I was still hopeful after I finished that we would break the 10 minute barrier. And that didn't even happen as we ran a 10 flat. That was really kind of what could have been expected after a week like that. Here comes the 2018 Pikes Peak Hill Climb and I'm as excited as ever because it's my 25th year racing up Pikes Peak, overcoming all the problems we had last year and the two red flags. I am really anxious to get the Geico Chevy back to Pikes Peak. We're making some serious changes to the car to make it faster and we're, we're not just going for the win, we're gonna try to get the, the Pikes Peak open record and really looking forward to a great race in 2018. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? All right. That is the most awkward introduction video ever in the history of church life, speaking, teaching God's word. Like, uh, I get it and understand that. I'm excited to race Pike Speak next week. Honored to be here. Excited to have our car here. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm uh, embarrassed by that video. Like, that's just not, like... I'm, I'm like, do we really have to show the video? Like, <laughs> um, I'm thrilled to be here. Happy Father's Day to everybody. Happy Rad Dad Day. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful. Many years ago, I uh, got to meet your pastor uh, at a church in San Diego for a pastor's conference. We became friends, and uh, this is my third time here uh, with you guys at Radiant, and it's just a huge, huge honor. And I think because it is Father's Day, I think you have an amazing father of the house in your pastor, and I think we should honor Pastor Todd. And uh, you're a great dad to his children, but he's a great dad to this house and this church, and so it's an honor. 
uh, for me to be here. We, we are going to study God's Word together. That's the real reason I'm here. And we're going to go to a great dad story in Luke chapter 15. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to kind of give you a little framework as to why is a race car driver speaking at church? Like, what in the world is going on? I actually grew up here in Colorado Springs, born and raised here, grew up a mile and a half from here on South Carefree. Uh, like, we could just go ahead and walk to my house uh, from here. So this is literally my stomping grounds, where I was raised. I lived in Village 7 until I was uh, almost 16 years old when we moved to the south side of town down off of Highway 115. And, uh, and then uh, my junior year of high school uh, just got radically on fire for Jesus at a youth ministry uh, when I met my youth pastor. Uh, his name is Chris Hodges. And so uh, he was my youth pastor all throughout high school and then, and then my early 20s. Then he moved from Colorado Springs back to his home church of Beth, at Bethany uh, World Prayer Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. But I stayed close to him uh, for many, many years. Uh, and then about seven years later, uh, he was going to go plant a brand new church in Birmingham, Alabama and shared that story with my wife and I. And we felt called to leave Colorado Springs 17 years ago to help Pastor Chris Hodges start Church of the Highlands, which is a miracle story, absolutely miracle uh, for us uh, to, to be there and be a part of Church of the Highlands from the last 17 years, starting in a high school. We were in a high school for six and a half years. We didn't have any facilities of our own. And now 17 years later, we have 17 locations, uh, nine of which are in high schools. Uh, we still have church in different cities in high schools and are now the second largest church in America. It's a miracle. Church of the Highlands is a miracle. God's moved in a great way. And, uh, and so I've been a pastor there for 17 years, but I'm from here and, uh, and grew up here. And uh, so I'm just so excited to be home and to get to do my, my day job, if you will, back in my hometown. I uh, uh, want to introduce and say happy Father's Day to my dad, who is actually here. Dad, I love you. I appreciate you and uh, am thrilled to keep racing with you. And uh, he's been working on my car and preparing it for years, even when he was racing. He holds the record of 40 years years racing on Pikes Peak. Nobody else is even close to that yet, and uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, he retired in 2014 on his 40th run, and uh, in the car that you've just watched on video, uh, we blew the engine on Friday. So the car that is out there is not repairable in the time needed to race it next weekend. And so my dad has pulled his car out of retirement. I'm going to race his car up Pikes Peak. So that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. We're going to have a, we're going to have a great week. Uh, and I want to introduce you to my family. Uh, only one of them is here with me. So here's some ladies in my life. I love this picture uh, because some of you are wondering, oh, does he have three daughters? Um, that I don't. I have two daughters, which means one of them is my wife. I love that picture because she just looks so great and so young, you, you can't tell. Last night at the North Campus, I had a couple that were like, we were convinced it was the girl on the right. And I'm like, no, it's the girl on the left, okay? Her name is Rachel. We've been married 22 years, um, and uh, you should give her a hand for that. Uh, and then uh, my youngest, Devin, is in the middle, and then my oldest, Ashlyn, who they thought was my wife, who is my 18-year-old daughter, is on the right. And, uh, and uh, she is a special miracle to our entire family, not just me, uh, because we had the wonderful privilege of adopting her six hours after she was born in Independence, Kansas, over 18 years ago. Yeah, so she's a miracle in our life. And that story got extra sweet just on our way here to Colorado Springs because on Thursday we left Birmingham at 5 a.m. We drove uh, to Wichita, Kansas, and I had the wonderful privilege to be a witness and to get to introduce my daughter Ashlyn to her birth mother for the very first time at Cracker Barrel in Wichita. It was amazing. Yeah. Give God praise for that. Uh, she also got to meet her half-sister that's five years old that she'd never met and uh, one of her grandmothers uh, that she had never met. It was so sweet and so special, so awesome. And I've never been more proud to be a dad and never been more proud of my baby girl. She's sitting right over here. Ashton, I love you so much. And uh, so proud of you. I've literally never been more proud of her 
than the moment that she got to meet her birth mother. It was just so cool, and you're beautiful on the inside and out, and, uh, and Thursday uh, night at Cracker Barrel was awesome. I will never forget it, um, and uh, uh, we got to keep going, all right? So that's a little bit about me, my family, and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to get into God's Word here. How, how many of you have ever uh, had a bad impression of somebody? Yeah. I wonder how many of us have had people that had a bad impression of us. Or, or let, let me take it up another, another notch or a different direction. How many of you have had a false impression of someone? And that means people have probably had a false impression of you. And I think oftentimes we have a false impression of who God is. It's, it's kind of like that person, you're like, man, they're such a jerk. Well, then weeks or months go by, you get to know them, and all of a sudden you're like, well, they're not actually a jerk. I just, I just had a false impression. I just, I misinterpreted what, what signals I was seeing from this person, and, 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 and what was real was different than our perception, right? And so that happens all the time with God. So many people see God the Father with the wrong lens and have the wrong impression of who he is. And Jesus, who is God's son, came to earth and he spent 33 years here and while he was here uh, doing ministry he he would teach and he would tell stories and he tells this story that's absolutely amazing and I believe he tells this story to co correct a false impression of who God is he wanted to make sure that we understood who his father really was because so many of us have that wrong impression. I, I grew up in church here in Colorado Springs. Great church, and it's awesome and everything, but I, I had a false impression of who God was. I thought he carried around a sledgehammer in one hand, lightning bolt in the other, waiting for me to mess up. Like that was God to me. That was my impression of who he was, is that he was this, this, this faceless ruler sitting on this throne, right? And just waiting for Lane to make a mistake and then kapow, you know, like that, but that's not who he is. And so Jesus is trying to, I believe, paint the, the proper picture of who his father is and the nature of who God is. See, a lot of us, uh, uh, we know the name God, but we don't know the nature of God and what that truly is. And I'm gonna to read to you a familiar story out of Luke 15. You, you've probably heard it called the prodigal son story. And Jesus didn't call it the prodigal son story. That's us. When, when, the, when the, 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 the Bible translators took the Greek and put it into English, they kind of put a little heading in different places. Jesus told the story of two sons, not one son, a story of two sons and a father. And he paints this amazing picture of who the Father is, and that picture is who we should see God as. And so what happens was, is one of the sons, actually the younger of the two, uh, said something to his father, which had to have been the most painful thing the father had ever heard. He went to his father and he said, he said, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance. Now the scriptures don't say in quotes, I wish you were dead. They do say, he said, I want my inheritance. But what that means, especially in that culture, is I wish you were dead because I want what I'm gonna get when you die and I want it right now. So he had no relationship or no relational investment. It didn't care about a relationship with his father. He only wanted the benefits that he wanted. And so I can't imagine the pain that this father is dealing with in this story where one of his sons is like, I wish you were dead, give me my money, I'm out of here. Culturally, if one child got their inheritance, they all received their inheritance. So even his brother received his inheritance at that time. This son goes away, runs away, takes what, what he had been blessed with, takes what, what he had received from his father, took his inheritance, and wastes it all. We don't know on what or what he did. We just know that he ends up in the pigsty, literally eating with the pigs. And he comes to the realization like, wow, the people that serve my dad, the people that work for my dad are better off than I am. Maybe I know that I'm no longer his son, but maybe he will allow me to come work with the servants and, and it's better than this. And so, so he's probably rehearsing some type of of. of of, of, of statement or how he's going to apologize to his dad and ask to be brought back into the family so he can just survive. And that's where we pick up this story in verse 20 of Luke chapter 15. Now, remember, we want to see who the, the nature of God is here. So he returned home. This is the son who had left 
to, he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. I love this right here. See, see God is always looking for you. He is always looking for you to come home. He is always longing for relationship. Filled with love and compassion, not a sledgehammer and a lightning bolt. See, different, different perception of, of who God is, okay? He ran to his own son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. Everybody say celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. Everybody say life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. So here, the nature of our God is to celebrate when his son is in relationship with him. Not to bring discipline and correction and not to make his life miserable. Oh, you took your inheritance. You blew your inheritance. I'm going to make you pay for that. Yeah, you better go work in the fields. You better go work with the servants. You better pay it back. No, it was none of that. It was a celebration, a big celebration. That's the nature of our God. See, Jesus, in Luke 15, this isn't the only story he told. He told a few stories in Luke 15. You have to know about the audience and who he's speaking to. See, he was speaking to people who had no relationship with God, and he was also speaking to the religious leaders. So in his audience represented both sons, those who are in church, those who haven't gone off and blown their inheritance, and those who are far from God. And Jesus is trying to explain to them, it's, it's, this story is not just about the one son, but it's also about the other and so we pick it up in verse 25 meanwhile the older son was in the field working that's very interesting see he's he's doing the right thing when he returned home he heard music and dancing in the house and he asked one of the servants what was going on your brother is back he was told your father has killed the fattened calf we are celebrating because of his safe return the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. Here, get this. See, the father was looking for the lost son and ran out to hug him. The father still pursues the son who stayed home and came out to talk to him. The father wants relationship with those who are here and those who are far away. That's the nature of who he is. But he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one goat for a feast with my friends. You can just hear his attitude. Nyeh. <laughs> Yet with this, when this son of yours comes back, very interesting. He didn't call him my brother. See, so even the, the son who stayed home had broken relationships. Didn't even call him his own brother. He's not happy to see him. All he cares about is what, what was in it for him. He received his inheritance early because of his brother, yet he still won't even acknowledge that's his brother. Broken relationship with the father and with the brother. And this is quite interesting right here. So he came back after squandering your money on prostitutes and you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. You read the story, Jesus never said he squandered his money on prostitutes. But here's what happens. Religious people will always assume the worst of people far from God. They will be critical of those who are not in church, who are not doing the right thing, who are not acting the right way. So this brother is judgmental of his other brother and the father was not judgmental. The father was gracious and compassionate. See, it's a different lens. And the son who stayed home was just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, actually my crowd. I'm a pastor, I'm one of them. I go to a lot of church, Church of the Highlands, 17 campuses. Some of them have up to six services. 
on a weekend. Five on Sunday, one on Monday. I go to a lot of services. I could end up being the brother who stayed home, who doesn't realize the nature of who God is. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're like, well, I haven't ever squandered everything. I've done the right things. I, I go to church. I pray. I read my Bible. I am, I, am, I am working out everything I can work out to live right, and yet we could be out of relationship because that's not what God is looking for. Verse 31, his father said to him, you could just hear the, the compassion. He's probably, his heart is just broken. Now he has a son that's been home that he realizes has been lost all along. Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he has found. And so what are the things that break relationship? with God and with people. I wanna share with you some enemies of relationship that I see in this story, some things that hurt the relationship of the, of the son who stayed home. That's what I'm talking about. If you're lost today, if you're far from God, if you've never given Jesus your life, you've already seen the beautiful God that loves you and wants you to come home. For those of you that are here, and maybe the son that has been here, in church, in the right place, doing the right things, but maybe the relationship is broken. Why is that? Here's some of the enemies. Number one, it could be prosperity. You might say, Lane, I'm not very prosperous. I'm unemployed, I'm, I'm barely getting by. I understand that some of us in the room might have some, some tough times that we're in right now, but basically, if you're in America, and you're an American, you are prosperous by the world standards and for the most part, most, I don't know everybody's story, but most of us in here are very prosperous. The fact that we're in an air-conditioned building on a hot day uh, is a blessing. Like there, There's a lot of things that, that, that uh, we are blessed to be a part of and, and, and amazing things in our life. But that can be an enemy of relationship. See, the, the brother who stayed home was very prosperous. Not only was he still making his living, but he had received his inheritance. And that prosperity did not help his relationship. He was in a place where he was feeling, I have no need. And what does that produce? That produces self-sufficiency. So when we're able to take care of everything, then we have no need for God, and that will break the relationship or keep us from the right relationship. The second enemy of relationship would be morality. What do you mean by morality, Lane? It's this brother doing the right things. He basically said, I have no fault, which produces self-righteousness so I'm living right I'm doing the right things I haven't killed anybody lately I don't break the law well I, I do speed every now and then um, oh don't think it's just me I, I get it I get it well you're a race car driver you must speed well you want to be a race car driver so you speed like, like I know it happens but for the most part you're like I'm living right I'm a good person the scale between good and bad, the good deeds, bad deeds, I'm always keeping it tipped enough where the good outweighs the bad. So, so I, I'm a moral person, and, and that self-righteousness will destroy our relationship with God because we think we're just doing all the right things, going through the right motions. I, I, I had the privilege to lead a mission trip back on spring break at Church of the Highlands. One of my uh, uh, first responsibilities 17 years ago was to start our youth ministry and to start a ministry school that's called Highlands College. So now we're 17 years into that. There's almost 1,000 students in Highlands College. It's a full-time ministry school uh, where we're, we're training young people to be in ministry. Uh, it's two years, so four semesters. And my wife and I decided all those students have to be in small groups uh, during the week. And so uh, my wife and I decided to lead one two years ago. And so we have 17 college students that we've walked through their two years of college. And we've been planning for two years to take them on a mission trip in their last semester. So that was just... Uh, uh, basically a month and a half ago, two months ago, and on spring break, we took a missions trip to Tokyo, Japan. It was life-changing, absolutely amazing. 38 million people, the largest city in the world. Mind-blowing. All you see is prosperity. 
I mean, the buildings, everything is, is pristine and beautiful. I mean, so many people. The, the Japanese people are obviously brilliant. They, 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 they've come up with great things. They make better cameras than we do. Uh, I, I'm obviously, I'm a Chevy guy, okay? Chevrolet all the way. But I will admit, in some cases, they build better cars than we do. It's like, and some of you are driving them. We can talk about that later, okay? But anyways, they're a prosperous people. They're also a very moral people. If you spend time in Japan, you see honor like you've never seen honor. They're an honorable society. They, they honor their elders. They honor people. The, 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 the city, 38 million people, literally has no crime. No crime. It's the cleanest place I've ever been. Tokyo makes Switzerland look like a landfill. Like it's unbelievable. The streets look like somebody vacuumed them every night. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. They follow the rules. They live right. They're good people, so why would they need God? They're the, the, the center square, if you will, the Times Square of Tokyo is called Shibuya Square. Shibuya is where five, five different roads come into one intersection. It's a lot like Times Square, huge uh, skyscrapers with neon lights and all that and LED screens and advertising and all that. One million people per day walk across that intersection. It's unbelievable. I went out on an early morning run one of, one of the days I was there and, and I got to, I was only a block or two off of Shibuya and, and it, the city's amazingly quiet in the morning and I come up to a street where there's a, a crosswalk, red light. It's one lane wide. Like if I would have run fast enough, I could have jumped across the street. One lane wide, there are business people on either side waiting for the crosswalk to change. I get up there and I stop and I look. There wasn't a car to be seen. There's no cars coming. Any good American would walk right now. <laughs> like, why are we not walking? They're just standing there looking at the red light, both sides. So I'm like, I'm going. And then I realize, wait a minute, I might go to jail. <laughs> so out of respect, I just waited. And sure enough, it turned green. And they just walked across the street. There were no cars. But they are a good people. Prosperity. Morality. Highest suicide rate in the world. They're killing themselves in unprecedented numbers. Absolute, absolutely horrific. And as you talk to the Japanese and you talk to the pastors, we were working with Lifehouse Church, which is doing a phenomenal job. They, have, they, they, they now have 18 campuses in Southeast Asia, most of which are in Japan. God is moving in a great way. But they have prosperity and morality, yet they have no hope. They don't have Jesus so prosperity and morality will not help our relationship. It will hurt our relationship in the last enemy. And this we can all fall prey to, and that's familiarity. It just becomes another day. It's just another relationship. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go to church at, at least once this month. Uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pray over, over our, my meals. I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pray before I go to work. Like, it just becomes familiar. And that puts us in a place where we have no gratitude. And that's dangerous. In any relationship, that's dangerous. And that produces self-entitlement. I don't know if any of you have seen any entitlement around this generation any, anywhere lately. Like, like we, we, I should probably just not even go there. Actually, you owe me something. I'm breathing right now. Can you, don't you owe me something? Like, the government owes me something. Like, like, but but we, we, when we become so familiar, we become entitled. Oh, oh, my wife should do this and she should do that. Oh, my manager should do this and do that. It becomes so familiar. See, familiarity can destroy your marriage. It can destroy any relationship, not just your relationship with God. These are enemies of relationship. And I want to make sure I'm in a place of right relationship. How can, how can we get to right relationship? Because right location doesn't guarantee right relationship. Just because you're at church doesn't mean you're in right relationship with Jesus. Just because I go home doesn't mean I'm in right, right relationship with my daughters or my wife. Location has nothing to do with it. And so we've got to shift and we need to work toward right relationship. How do we do that? Number one, we need to be dependent. 
where we're at a place where I say, I need you, God. This produces the opposite of self-sufficiency. I can't do it on my own, God. I need you. I need to be spirit-empowered. John 15, 5, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. But a lot of us are like, I got this. We just go to work for another day. I got this. I don't, I don't need God at work. I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm good at it. I'm fine. Oh, I've been married for 22 years. I got this. I'm fine. I've been a parent for 18 years. I got this. I'm fine. Whatever it is, no. We have to be dependent on God. Therefore, I need to declare my need for God even when I feel I don't need God. That's a decision that we can make every single day. That's a decision that I need to make every single day. Number two, we need to be repentant. That's saying, you know what, God, I turn toward you. That is the opposite of self-righteous. It is Jesus-centered. Repent only means to turn. It's, it's not a hard word. It's not a, it's not a tough word. It's just a turn. I want to go this way. I want to do my thing. I want to be what Lane wants to be. And, and repent is just, Jesus, where do you want me to be? What do you want me to go? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to become? And I know this about the nature of our God. God's perfect will for your life is exactly what you would choose if you could see the future. So, so, so you think that if, if you have the, a misperception of who God is, you think his will is miserable. Honestly, when he called us to Alabama, I was like, oh, Lord, I'm in Colorado Springs. I'm in paradise. Alabama? I mean, he might as well have been calling me to South Sudan. Like, it's like I was freaked out. But now that I'm in the future, 17 years later, I'm so thankful. I've loved Alabama every day that I've been there. That's supernatural. That's what God does. His will for you is what you would choose. So to repent is not a negative thing. It is not a painful thing. It is just aligning ourselves with Jesus, just centering ourselves on Jesus. And what happens then is the end result will be his will happening in our life, which is a beautiful thing. Joel, the prophet, says this in chapter 2, 12 through 13. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. All he cares about is what's on the inside. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. That's his nature. That's his nature. Slow to anger. His nature abounding in love. His nature, and he relents from sending calamity. I will turn my heart toward Jesus. Number three, the way we're gonna get there is we have got to be thankful. Because if we are prosperous and, and if, if we become self-entitled, if we become self-righteous, we will lose our gratitude toward God. And that is a place of I love you, which produces the opposite of self-centered, and that is father-focused. God, I'm going to be focused on you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love you for this reason. So why, why do we love God? Oh, oh, he saved me from hell. Why, why do we love God? Oh, I, you know, I, I prayed with one of the prayer team after a service, and, and I got that job. Or I had my best friend pray with me, and I got that promotion. Are, are you loving God for those reasons, for what you feel are the benefits that he's given you? First John four nineteen says, we love for this reason, because he first loved us. That's why. That's why we love God. Therefore, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So I need to be in a place where I'm more thankful for the relationship than I am for the results. Because that is the right place of relationship. So I, God, I don't care if you answer another prayer. I don't care if I don't get that job or if my, my best friend doesn't get healed of cancer. If my prayers are never answered, God, I'm gonna love you because of who you are. See, God is not looking for your performance to love you. So you shouldn't look for his performance to love him. Because that's not what it's all about. It's about a relationship with him. Not what we do, but who we know in Jesus' name. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads all over the room? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for all of us that we would be in right relationship. 
God, I just know that so many times I slip to the wrong side. I feel like I'm doing it right, living right, and yet I know that I'm pulling myself away from you. And God, I just pray for every person here that we wouldn't let the enemies of relationships separate us from you, but we would combat them, Lord God, with this a heart of gratitude and love for you. God, that we would be dependent upon you, Lord, and we would live repentant lives that we would always turn toward you and away from our own desires. And God, I thank you for your amazing nature. And I pray for every person here that's had a misconception the misinterpretation of who you are. God, I pray for new filters over their eyes as they see you. They would see your love for them and how gracious and compassionate you are. And God, we thank you that you desire relationship with us. Thank you that you're looking for those to come home that need to come home and that you love those that are home that have been separated from you relationally. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you love us first. In Jesus' name. If you would, keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to pray for those people that are here today that know you're not in right relationship with Jesus. You might be the son that's been in church. You've been going through the motions. You've been throwing up prayers here and there. You, you believe in God, but you don't know him. You don't have a life-giving relationship with Jesus. And there might be those here today that, that they remember what it was life, like to have that relationship, but just over time, the enemies of relationship have separated you from God, and like a long-lost friend, an old high school buddy you just haven't talked to in years, you know that you need to come back to Jesus. So whether you need to come to him for the first time or whether you need to come back to him, I want to pray for you right where you are. I'm not going to call anyone out. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I'm, going to, I'm just going to pray for you right where you're seated. But if you'd say, Lane, that's me. I want right relationship with Jesus today. On the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. No one's looking around. Every eye is closed. Every head bowed. This is between you and God. And I don't even need to see your hand. It's for him to see it. It's for your faith to move toward him. If you'd say, Lane, that's me. One, whether it's coming back to a relationship. Two, or whether it's going to him for the first time. Three, lift your hand right now all over the room. All over the room. Wow, lots of hands going up. It's for God to see it, not me to see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, all over the room. Up top, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. It's awesome. Anyone else, just slip your hand up. God, that's me, I'm ready. You can put your hands back down. I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer. Actually, I'm gonna ask the whole church. Let's all pray together. This prayer, it is not a box checked and okay, I'm done. It is the beginning of a relationship, a life-giving relationship. It's not the end, but the beginning. So church, everyone, those that raise their hands, let's pray this out loud, passionately for Jesus. Say this, Lord God, I want a relationship with you. I want you to be my Lord. I accept what you did on the cross when you died and paid for my sins. I ask you to forgive me for living life without you. Come live inside of me through your Holy Spirit so we can have relationship. Thank you for loving me first. Thank you for unconditional forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen and amen. Let's give God praise for changed lives, for his word. Would you stand with me all over the room? We want to do one more song of worship and just declare that he's our father, that we love him more than anything. So God, we love you and we thank you that you loved us first. So we worship you, we lift you up. We sing this song, Lord, not just saying words, but declaring our love for you, declaring our dependence on you, and giving you our very best. In Jesus' name, let's sing together.
going to ask our prayer teams to come at this time. They're here to pray with you, whatever your need may be. Now, let me say, if you've gotten a right relationship with the Lord today, you're beginning a new walk with God, I would particularly encourage you to have one of these folks pray with you and to give you some material to help you in your walk with God. The decision you made is wonderful, but it's just the beginning. And if you have need of prayer in any area of your life, we have a God who answers prayer and who does miracles. I'm going to come down here to pray with those who have a need and our prayer team members, our people who have great faith in what God can do through prayer. So if you need prayer, please come. Otherwise, please take advantage of what's going on around the campus. Out front, we have some really neat cars and the food smells amazing. And Andres, actually, before he came back up here to play the guitar, had some kind of almost sinful looking thing but he said it was delicious and uh, no condemnation today so we're good but there's plenty of time so if you want to come for prayer the food will still be there God bless you you're dismissed have a great week happy Father's Day